Kawina La. This is Hawaii is my mainland on Think Tech Hawaii Fridays, usually at 3 p.m. And I'm Kawi Lucas. Last week, I spoke with Martha Noyes on Hawaiian archaeoastronomy at Kukani Loko as a way of illustrating the fundamentally different way Hawaiians conceptualize the universe without the rigid confines and artificially discrete disciplines like science that Western thought has evolved. This week, my guest Euclid Aluli, attorney for Kahea, talks about the recently concluded contested case hearing over whether the Hawaii Department of Land and Natural Resources should grant a construction permit for the TMT International Observatory on top of Mauna Kea. Aloha, Euclid. And so what's it like to be involved in a case with 44 days of evidentiary hearings involving 71 witnesses? <laughs> Completely unexpected. <laughs> and when we began, they thought it would only take two weeks. So they started wow. with a, a schedule uh, that would be conclude by the end of October. And then we rolled into Thanksgiving and, and they had to, so you can see how the days got spread out. And finally, I mean, we went through Christmas. I remember writing things uh, that were due on the 27th of December and then the reply on the 30th. So it was hell. It was hard reading, reading this summary that I just, that I sent to you. So you're the, uh, representing Kahea, <coughs> the Hawaiian Environmental Alliance. Yes. Um, they're a local 501c3. And, and tell, tell us about what, what the standing was. Um, well, Kahea, interestingly enough, has been in, they were involved back in 2011 when on the, which was the the appeal in the end and they also were involved when they attempted to um, uh, the University of Hawaii uh, were trying to get a permit from the uh, DLNR for a thing called the outrigger telescopes and they were very much another configuration that was huge for the um, um, the summit so this controversy if you think of it as having the, the contested case having concluded on March 2nd of 2017 has been going on for approximately 20 years Wow over the size of this thing and where it's going to be located. So that's how long, in fact, Kahea was formed back then for this very purpose. Wow. Yeah, by okay. uh, uh, Vicki Holt Takamini was the first president of it. Wow. Yes. Okay. So that's why you're here, because you know this stuff. <laughs> well, I didn't. I had to, and <laughs> I didn't know all that stuff, so. Okay, so you're in Hilo. There's this massive um, amount of, of people who are uh, witnesses, and it's going on and on. What, what's happening? What are you learning? What are you hearing? What was it well, like? Well, one of the things that happened was um, a good Dexter Kayama, who was another attorney, uh, he and I uh, s stepped in for uh, Naivi Wordeman, who had handled the appeal from the previous contested uh, case hearing, both at the level of the circuit court and then at the Hawaii Supreme Court, which bounced it back. So we were the bounce back. And by the time he concluded, he had, if you look at it, he attended the first um, four or five hearings in Hilo to s suss out who were the, who were the parties going to be. And then he just, he just couldn't, he needed help or he wanted to take a break. And so I had always told him if you need a second chair, not the only chair, <laughs> but, <laughs> but we, we managed, we just didn't expect it was going to be um, 44 days. 
and we really worked hard. So uh, there were two attorneys for CAHEA. There was, uh, for the University of Hawaii Hilo, there were three attorneys from Carl Smith Ball. And from TIT, TMT, now known as TIO, there were three attorneys from Doug, Douglas Ng's law firm. And then they had this other nonprofit that, that had been formed to say, we want the scholarship. And they are called P-U-E-A-O. And they had a local counsel from Torkelson Katz. And so, and the only other lawyer uh, who's not, is, was Larry Simpkin, and he represented the Temple of Lono. And everyone else was pro se. Yep, so that was EPIC. Okay, give us a taste of what EPIC means. Well, every, you had people who were not lawyers who had the opportunity to cross-examine witnesses and bring on their own witnesses. And so I thought, I liked that. And in that, you know, in the service of that, you, I would go a long way. But that sort of tended to um, make things a little more unwieldy. But um, we had some incredible, um, what we call pro se or for themselves, uh, parties who became the experts on cross-examination. I mean, awesome. And yeah. Anything particularly memorable you, you can think of in that vein? Well, one of the parties, his name is uh, E. Kalani Flores, and he is a, a professor of Hawaiian lifestyle at uh, one of the community colleges up in uh, Kona. And so when he did a cross-examination uh, early in the hearing, it was of the the man who wrote either the application or the environmental impact statement, he did, did such a great job that when he finished, everyone applauded in nice. the room. And the judge said, what YouTube did you watch? It was so fantastic. And so from that point on, we knew he could always cover his action, you know. Wait a minute, what YouTube did you watch? Well, they must have cross-examination YouTubes. I'm, <sighs> these, they were excellent, you know, and they continue to be excellent. And I think that's a, that's a good thing, you know, to, if you're gonna have to do this on the cheap, which is what has happened here, then the parties need to be you know, um, helped uh, to get some skills so they can survive. So do, can you see this being, would you like to see more of this in, in, in general in Hawaii? In, in well, it'll be, I don't know if they're going to ever have this again. I mean, the, the contested case hearing that they, that this was the bounce back from, was done by another hearings officer. Um, his name is Paul Aoki. And it took eight days. And uh, it took him a year to render a decision because he had to read all the papers. Versus this one took 44 days. And we've got a time frame where, you know, end of May, we've got a, you know, so she's got a time frame that I had sent to you where she's trying to make a decision. Of course, we're getting pressured for the decision. Because they want to either build or, or go on to the Canary Islands. I, they've, they've got their right. plan B. Um, right. The TMT has their plan B worked out now. Right. So, um, so, is, so, so they have until, until the end of... May. Well, they've set, set they have set a uh, wish list for themselves that they would like to be permitted and underway by uh, a year from now. And between a year from now and now, we have to come up with a decision and order. 
plus they recently had their sublease vacated by the judge up in Hilo um, and but they don't really need to have a sublease because they've got some folks operating up there right now without subleases. You mean some folks with observatories? Yes. <laughs> and so it's, I mean, it's pretty uh, cowboy up there is what I would say. Let's, we have some, some visuals. There's a, um, uh, like a earth, earth shot that has the um, existing observatories up there mapped out to, to kind of get a, a feel of, of what that looks like. If we could have that and um, to, yes, the earth one. There we go. <clears throat> so um, it's kind of busy up there. It's 13 observatories with a total of 22 structures all at the summit of Mauna Kea and there is no longer any room up there to situate these larger observatories that they're all wanting to build um, so they can encounter the black hole somehow <laughs> and uh, or the Big Bang Theory although it happened millions of years ago, so it's bizarre to me, but they all fit. So now they have moved to the northern plateau. I was just trying to remember if it's the northern or the, but it's pristine. So those are the photographs that they have of how, here it is without these observatories and part of you know, the Native Hawaiian practice. Aloha, you can join the Hawaii Farmer Series every Thursday from 4 to 5 on ThinkTech. And I'm your co-host Matthew Johnson here with Justine Espirito. And we are so thankful to have this show to use as a forum to get to know all the movers and shakers in agriculture in Hawaii and hear kind of their background in history as well as... Uh, their perspective on what they're doing and also the future for agriculture in Hawaii. 
So join us every Thursday. You can tweet in your own comments and suggestions and be a part of the conversation at Think Tech High. And we hope to see you every single Thursday. Welcome back to Hawaii is my mainland. I'm Kawi Lucas, and with me here today is Euclid Luli, who is one of the attorneys for Kahea, the Hawaiian Environmental Alliance, and she has just been through a legal marathon, truly an epic. <laughs> 44 days of contested case right. hearings. Okay, so in those 44 days, we know that there were some, can you kind of give us some of the things that really- Well, um, I, I, first of all, I did not know how long this had all been going <laughs> on. And I wanted to acknowledge the Kupuna, Marty Townsend being one of them. I mean, John Osorio, this whole group has been on this for decades that you, you know, so of course they all came and testified. But we had, we had a woman who is with the Kanaka Ole Foundation. Her name was Ku'ule Kanahele. And she's a Papahuli Honua researcher. She, a two page, well it's actually four pages, which I'll give to you. Um, and, and what she, she basically, um, you know, they have an idea of deities as being elemental. So they refer to them as elemental. So the, it is Wao Akua. She herself has never gone to the summit. There are many Hawaiians who have not for that very reason. You only go for a very specific purpose because it's literally that sacred, that mana. But it's also how it ties into water, which I had never considered. And so they've got these female deities up there, Poliahu, who is the snow, Lili Noi, who is the mist. And that Lili Noi is a huge component of Mauna Kea as an aquifer. As the, the you know, because that brings the drip that just goes into the bogs that are that high up and then go down into the aquifer and then out, you know, along the Hamaku. I mean, the, the water dispersal through those feminine deities at the top of Mauna Kea, I had never considered. And they're kind of standalone, fem standalone female deities, which I didn't realize that either. So I learned something there and I, I Thank you very much. Uh, and another thing that was un unbelievable was there was an archaeologist whose name is Patrick McCoy. And he'd been doing work up there since the 70s. And finally wrote an epic piece after all the EISs were given. This, this random exhibit submitted by the UH, probably by mistake, ended up being <laughs> the bomb is and this I'll give you a copy. UH? No, he's now retired, but he's ep it's epic because he his whole conversation was about the linkage of ascent and descent routes with these priest ads makers who had consecrated work and their retinue of people coming up and down that mountain and this pan Hawaii Island production of ads and it, the meaning of it and he just sort of put it all together so he took it from a real you know like you're up like that photo of above which we are so missing because we're just like oh it's not within this <laughs> building uh, pad, then we ignore it. But this just took it all into context. And he pretty much says Mauna Kea is a pilgrimage site. Oh. Yes. And it's, it bespeaks uh, the whole notion of how people, the leadership, uh, you know, how the chiefs came into being, how good, I mean, it was, in, it was active for five to 800 years up there. 
That's a good long time. Yep. And also that things never end. So he came up with this notion of post-abandonment event, which I thought, wow, that is something. Way after they stopped making adzes, people were still up there making shrines, you know, and they were encountered at the end of the 19th century, a good hundred years after contact. They're encountered up there. And that's been the story, and we've not talked about it. So that was wonderful. Um, so remind me what his name is. His name is Patrick McCoy. OK, and I will find a way. What I will do is I will post a link to it. I'm not sure how yeah, I'll Yeah, I'll um, give you this. And on the YouTube. So um, after today, when this is up on, the, um, up on YouTube, I'll put it in the comments, and then people can find a way to. Um, it is online. So I'll just put yeah. a li link to it wherever yes. it is. Yes. OK. Perfect. Yeah. Another kind of interesting thing was um, I just didn't know how much there, the bucks were involved. I was pretty naive. Well, but it's big, big money. Like? Well, I mean, I guess we got to look at some of their financials. They're also online. TMT, International Observatory, LLC. I mean, between 2014 and 2015, if you look at what's on GuideStar, their asset value went from 10 million to 50 million. And then you go, but show me the money. I mean, where is it? You don't even have a lease right now. It's all other stuff. It's all uh, intellectual property. And these are all allegedly nonprofits. But there, it's, it's the intellectual property that is bringing everybody to the table and they're having to make investment decisions about about it based on what can I sell to defense companies to you know whatever they're doing we will never I mean I guess you could you could perhaps get to it all but no one has the time we're just trying to stop them from bringing it over here. So there's big money. So you're saying that uh, that's the way they can afford to build and operate, or why they want to have an observatory up right. there. Because the knowledge that they will get from having the observatory, right. they will then be able to market in the form and of sell. intellectual property. Right. Well, thank yeah. you for connecting those dots. I know, which I never had thought about that. And I didn't realize, I mean, these guys you know, the top five um, employees are paid, uh, you know, from TMT. None of them live here in Hawaii. They're identified in these um, tax filings, and they're all making 300 grand apiece for, you know, some of it part-time, Caltech and UC Berkeley. So, and their partners are Canada, China, India, and Japan. And they all have percentage stakes in all of this. It's super interesting. Super interesting. Yeah. Not that there's anything inherently wrong or bad about it. It's just that they haven't done the groundwork or really from the very they haven't beginning. Taken, they haven't taken care of the INA. Uh, of, what, of what they have already up there, the scientific right. community. And I mean, so me, here we like, have, do you remember Liebert Landgraf? Do you remember him at all? He's an, um, he used to be the head of the BLNR. Uh, and before that, he was a forester for the BLNR. So six years after they start building up there, Buried in the file is this letter that he wrote to the, the big cheeses, because he was a small cheese back then, <laughs> saying, the proposed development of a 142-inch telescope under a tri-party agreement between France, Canada, and Hawaii is permissory on four other proposals, and whether the BLNR will allow the present lessee to sublet for the development. So he's going. It's, 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 a, it's becoming complicated. 
It is a difficult task to make an intelligent assessment of this proposal when it is dependent on the outcome of a previous proposal. The apparent ploy utilized by the University of Hawaii is a bombardment of information and proposals under the banner of education and scientific research. By the same guys, they seemingly are trying to ramrod these programs through, forsaking controlled and wise planning. Mm -hmm. How can $2.1 million in foreign currency, which that cracked me up, and $400,000 of U.S. money justify abandonment of controlled planning. It would cost millions more to undo a mistake. Let it serve as a reminder that the land area in question is under the jurisdiction of the State Department of Land and Natural Resources. This, in effect, says the mountain belongs to the people for their use and enjoyment. Education and scientific research is a noble, noble cause, but it should not be made at the loss, at a loss to the people. And, and that, that, that is it. That is it. Yeah, that is and it. And this man wrote this in 1974. Amazing. He sent it to Mayor Kimura. He sent it to Jimmy Clark, who used to be at the planning office. It's like the who's who of 40 years ago <laughs> and I am just I'm just going really yeah they, they, we we need to put his shrine somewhere I mean to have that what can we say really after after all this time I, I, I it's it's I just I we can't keep going we cannot I, I just this is beyond belief you can put this up this is a public record Euland we have about a minute left if you can believe it um, thank you so much for shedding a little light on this um, mysterious process of this uh, labyrinthine uh, process of legal on the one side and then very not legal on the other. Yeah. And um, heartbreaking. Right, right. Uh, the, we're, we all are members of the Broken Hearted Club. Yeah. Yeah, it's heartbreaking. So it's not over. No. And um, already there have been huge wins. Um, I, I think, I, I mean, I want to say that to you. I mean, and, and to Kahea, I read an, an article in an Australian business magazine that made it really clear that they've been listening to folks like you and really hearing that um, Hawaiians have been cut out of the discussion for way too long and that it's just not OK. It's not so, OK, yeah. yeah. And it's, it's an expenditure in defiance of modernity in another respect, because this is like already nearly outdated technology that we're destroying the summit over. Five years ago was the last time I was up there at Mauna Kea. Mm -hmm. And um, we went to the little visitor thing, and they have the docent telling the story. Right. And somebody there raised their hand and said, well, what do you think about all of these protesters and so forth? This was five years ago. And the guy said, you know, they don't really use all of the observatories they have up here now. I don't know why. This is the guy who yeah, works at the know. visitor center. I thought, oh, OK, well, <laughs> let's not do it then. <laughs> because those docents are all tied into the Office of Mauna Kea Management, which is under the University of Hawaii. So they are not representative of the DLNR at all. Mm. And that really, the DLNR should take that back because it's completely improper right. that they have left these lands, the ceded lands, from our Ali'i to a bunch of folks who have no appreciation for what no, it is, no understanding. Two of them maybe <laughs> are here on green cards. I mean, when you ask, I know, but they're not even. Yeah, I get it. They're not even permanently resident here. Uh, I mean, I guess they must be permanently resident, but they've made no commitment to. Well, who knows? They may not be here next week. 
<laughs> I'm sorry, that wasn't funny. But anyway, Euclid, thank you so much. I can tell that there's this, this story isn't over and we'll need another chapter sooner or later. Yes. <laughs> Mahalo. Thank you. <laughs> isn't that just...